Welcome to the Florida Bar Podcast, where we highlight the latest trends in law office and law practice management to help you run your law firm. Brought to you by the Florida Bar's Practice Resource Institute. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Hello, and welcome to the Florida Bar podcast brought to you by Legal Fuel, the practice resource center of the Florida Bar on Legal Talk Network. We're so glad you're joining us. This is Christine Bilbury. I'm a senior practice management advisor and one of the hosts for today's show, which is being recorded from our offices in Tallahassee, Florida. Hello, I'm Carla Eckhart. I'm a practice management advisor at the Florida Bar and a co-host of today's podcast. Our goal at the Practice Resource Center is to assist Florida attorneys with running the business side of their law practices. We focus on a different topic each month and carry the theme through our website with related tips, videos, and articles. So today, our guest is attorney Nora Riva Bergman. Nora is also an author and business coach who works with lawyers, law firms, and bar associations in the United States and Canada. She's been a licensed attorney since 1992 and is prepared, has practiced as an employment law attorney and certified mediator. Nora has served as an adjunct professor at both Stetson University College of Law and the University of South Florida, teaching courses in alternative dispute resolution and and negotiation. She has been a speaker at conferences for the American Bar Association, the Federal Bar Association, and the Florida Bar. She also served for eight years as the executive director of a voluntary bar association. Nora joined Atticus Incorporated as a certified practice advisor in 2006 and is the founder of Real Life Practice. She's also the author of the book, 50 Lessons for Lawyers, Earn More, Stress Less, Be Awesome, a practice handbook for attorneys. And this month, she is our featured speaker for the Legal Fuel Speaker Series, CLE, entitled Five Simple Lessons to Help You Earn More, Stress Less, and Be Awesome. Welcome to the show, Nora. Thank you, Christine. So, Nora, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your evolution from practicing law to coaching attorneys. First of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a treat to be here and have a chance to talk a little bit about uh, the work that I did with Legal Fuel to put this presentation together. My background is kind of varied, uh, but actually, before I went to law school, I was a musician for 10 years. So, law school is a bit of a second career for me. I went to Stetson here in St. Petersburg, Tampa Bay area where I live. And uh, after I got out of law school, I practiced law for about seven years. Uh, doing plaintiff's employment law. I was certified as a mediator and actually uh, did a lot of mediation work back then and uh, taught mediation and ADR at Stetson and the University of South Florida. And after about seven years into the practice, I decided I wanted to make some career changes for myself. So the opportunity arose for me to become the executive director of the St. Petersburg Bar Association, which was my local bar that I was a member of. Um, and I decided to take that opportunity um, and absolutely loved it. I mean, I will always be a bar exec at heart uh, on some levels. I really enjoyed being able to help other lawyers with their practices. That was the one thing that really stood out to me as executive director for the bar. Um, that was my favorite part of the work that I did. And in the early 2000s, I was fortunate to meet a guy named Matt, Mark Powers, who is the founder of Atticus, the company that I work with. And uh, Mark started talking with me about the idea of becoming a practice advisor with the company. So I went through about a year of certification with them. And then in 2006, I started working as a business coach and practice advisor with Atticus. And I've been with Atticus ever since. People have asked me in the past, you know, well, how did you go from you know, being a bar exec to being a business coach? And why did you make that transition? And it was a very easy transition for me because my, my favorite part of my role as executive director of the Bar Association was helping lawyers with their law practices. And so I was able to take that piece of what I did and essentially make it all of what I do. So that is the focus of my work now on a variety of different levels, from one-on-one -on -one coaching with lawyers across the country uh, to working with uh, larger law firms and practice groups within larger law firms, uh, speaking, writing, with everything directed at how to help lawyers actually improve not just their practices, not just their businesses, but their lives. 
so that it's been fun. It's been a, it, it's been a fun journey. I love that. So you've kind of approached it from every angle, and, and that makes you an authority. Um, lawyers really like evidence because I think they're skeptical about if you can actually achieve real work-life balance in the legal profession. So what results can you tell us about from working with attorneys or firms who have embraced some of your lessons? That is a great question. So let me answer it kind of in this way. Um, First, that phrase, work-life balance, it's an elusive thing, isn't it? What does that mean exactly? It can be be very different uh, for different people. So, in order to find what works for you, um, it's going to take some experimentation, I guess, with some of the strategies that I talk about. And I will say that a lot in, in the presentations that I give and in my work with, with my clients. You know, um, the strategies that I talk about in, in the book, for example, and in the presentation um, are strategies and methodologies that work. We know they work, not just in, in the legal a profession or in the business of law, uh, but in other types of businesses. But the fact that a particular strategy works or has been shown to work doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you until you figure out how to make it work for you. So let me give you an example. One of the things that I talk about uh, in my book and also in the presentation is, is the concept of what I refer to as huddles. Uh, some folks that are that are familiar with these meetings, they're actually called stand-up meetings by some folks, are exactly that, short meetings that you can implement in your practice. And by short, I mean 10 minutes or less that happen on a regular basis, ideally, same time, same place, same people, every single day. Uh, the focus of the huddle is to give you the opportunity to answer questions from the people on your team, give them access to you, you know, so they're not chasing you to the restroom to ask you a question or perhaps down to your car when you're trying to go to lunch to ask you a question because they have no idea when they might actually get to talk to you. That concept of implementing those huddles every day uh, can make a tremendous difference in the effectiveness of your law firm. Um, it will give you, the lawyer, and everyone on your team, uh, a greater sense of control and kind of having a sense of what you're actually working on, what's getting done and who's doing it. The greater the sense of control, the lower the stress level for most people. So in terms of results, folks that implement that one simple, simple doesn't always mean easy though, right? Simple strategy uh, can have a tremendous impact on your effectiveness uh, and your stress level, your ability to get your work done when you're at the office so that you can leave the office at a reasonable time and, and get work towards some balance in your life. But it's always a journey working towards balance. It's like a teeter-totter, you know, rarely is that teeter-totter straight. It's going to be up on one side and down on the other. Mm -hmm. And absolutely. I love that example because I'm thinking uh, what we hear a lot is that practicing law is isolating. You can be at a firm with 150 people and you feel all alone because there isn't a lot of human contact. Everyone's just kind of working away in their individual offices. So I can see Mm -hmm. um, the huddle idea being, you know, forming human bonds, getting you out of your office, but then all the productivity of of the updates, letting people know what's going on. That's an excellent example, Um, which leads right into my second question. Um, Even if you're... an attorney is doing a lot of things to personally to make things less stressful if they're you know exercising they're trying to get enough sleep I'm still a major source of stress on them can be the environment that they practice in and it's very difficult to change law firm culture because you know if you're huddling are you billing so I, I think there could be some resistance there are there things that one person can do to improve the quality of life or even the culture at their firm if they're facing you know people that aren't on board. Another great question. And so is there something that one person can do to change the culture of their firm? I would say probably not. I don't know that one person can change the culture of their firm. I think it takes an understanding uh, on the part of law firms and the people that uh, run those law firms to understand their own role in helping to support the health of the people that work for them. Mm -hmm. 
so just really briefly, I mean, my the presentation, uh, Five Simple Lessons, really focuses, 90% of that presentation are about lessons that are focused on individual lawyers, what you can do for yourself to help yourself earn more, stress less, and be awesome, mm-hmm. um, and, and strategies that you may implement, like the example that I just gave, uh, with your team or your key people, the huddle, for example. On a more global perspective, I think that law firms and those people responsible for running the law firms need to understand that they play a part, uh, and perhaps a bigger part than they might want to recognize uh, with respect to the health of the people that work for them. You know, there's a wonderful book that I that I talk about in the presentation, and I'd recommend it to everybody. It is a book called Dying for a Paycheck by a man named Jeffrey Pfeffer. Uh, it is packed with research and evidence, which is what lawyers like to see. Uh, a lot of data around what makes a healthy workplace and what can contribute to a toxic workplace. Um, and one of the quotes from that book uh, really resonated with me. Uh, and it's a quote from a man who won the Nobel Prize in 1998. His name is Amartya Zen. And he said that the success of an economy and a society cannot be separated from the lives that members of the society are able to lead. So I think that that speaks volumes, that particular quote speaks volumes to the responsibility of the businesses and what the businesses can do and actually responsible for uh, with respect to the health and wellness of their people. And the other component of that, from, from a cultural aspect, Christine, you know, you mentioned the word culture, mm-hmm. um, is that law firm cultures that are healthy, it, whose people are happy uh, and feel that their employer cares about them and is implementing policies and systems and procedures within the office to actually encourage wellness are law firms that are going to be more profitable. And there is a tremendous amount of data on that. So if you want to increase the profitability of your law firm, you have got to pay attention to the culture that exists within your law firm and do your best to create a culture that is healthy and that supports the people that are there. And you know, there are a couple things that, that you can do. Uh, uh, one of them is to help people have more control over their work life, mm-hmm. less micromanaging. That's one of the biggest uh, hot buttons for most people, not just lawyers. And to create a culture of community and social support so that what you alluded to, Christine, that sense of isolation and not having contact with other people is lessened so that there is a sense of you know being surrounded by other people that really care about you, not just how many hours you can bill, but that they care about you as a human being. I know that's kind of antithetical, maybe even heretical (laughs) thinking um, with respect to how law firms are run, but the firms that do really uh, pay attention to these things, I think would would attest to the the positive impact on their bottom line. And I think that's a good way to get buy-in at the top, so... So, so assuming you have buy-in at the top mm-hmm. um, and the firm is really focused on creating this culture, um, you talked about a lot about the impact of having control over your life or having that feeling that you have control and the locus of control, internal, external. Um, so what if one of the attorneys at the firm is one of those that feels like everything is happening to them, like they don't have control? Um, is there a way that management can shift this belief or is it hardwired into our personalities. So when, when, you, when we talk about locus of control, that is something that is personal to us. I don't think that really that is a particular, um, that's something that the, that the law firm is going to be able to contribute to. Now, here's what I mean by that. And just let me just take a step back here. So locus of control is, is a psychological theory, and it essentially says that all of us have either an internal or external locus of control. Those people who have an external locus of control, you know, have a sense that they don't really have a lot of control over their lives. Um, Other things happen to them. 
they tend to be reactive folks. They feel as though they really can't control their future. You'll hear people with an external locus of control. Their language is often, well, I didn't have a choice. I had no choice. I, I, you know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a choice. I had to do this. I had to do that. And a sense of no control in their own life. People with an internal locus of control are people with very different outlook, if you will. Their perspective on life is that they can control their destiny. They can affect the outcomes in their life. They can determine their future. They can choose how to respond to things that happen to them. You know, um, there's an old saying that says, you know, we cannot control those things that happen in our lives. The only thing that we can control is how we respond to those things. And our response is what determines the outcome in any given situation. So uh, choosing how to respond in a more positive way is going to present a more positive outcome. So somebody who's listening to us chat today, if they think about, well, you know, I feel as though I'm, I'm probably one of those people that has a more external locus of control. I don't feel like I have a lot of a lot of control of what happens in my life. What can I do about it? Well, there are some there are some very specific things that you can do to actually increase that internal locus of control. And uh, although this sounds kind of axiomatic, um, in order to increase your internal locus of control, start to realize that you can exercise more control in your life. Be very aware of the parts of your life that you can control. Even if they're small little pieces of your day, small little parts of your calendar, and I, I go into this in the presentation and talk about some strategies to, to really start to take control of your calendar on a personal level, paying attention to uh, how you talk to yourself. You know, we, we're all talking to ourselves all the time. Pay attention to that voice in your head and how you're treating yourself. And, you know, if that voice in your head were actually attached to someone outside of you, would you let someone talk to you the way perhaps that voice in your head talks to you? I don't know. And one other thing that I want to mention in terms of this concept of locus of control and being able to increase your internal locus of control is to, whenever possible, Make choices that demonstrate your control, as I alluded to, even if it's a small thing in your calendar. And in addition to that, whenever possible, when something happens to you, uh, and we all want to label just about everything that ever happens to us, um, and very often, and see if this isn't true for you, uh, very often we're gonna, we label things that happen to us as not necessarily positive things. We're drawn to more negative uh, labels when things happen to us to the extent that you can resist labeling, that's even better. But if you can't don't immediately label something that happens to you as bad, if you can label it as a positive, even better. Uh, but at, at the least try to look at things more neutrally. You know, we're lawyers, lawyers want to judge things. Lawyers, lawyers want to label things. That's essentially what we're, we're taught to do. Uh, so we're talking about changing very ingrained behavior. But the moment that you label something as bad when it happens to you, uh, suffering begins. You know, it stresses you out. Uh, all kinds of unintended consequences can flow from labeling something that happens to you as bad. Um, and think about times in your own life when you might something might have happened in your life and you labeled it as bad. And in retrospect, looking back on that event, it wasn't so bad. Perhaps it led you to something really wonderful that happened in your life. So uh, do your best not to label things that happened to you in your life as, as negative things. And whatever small pieces you can control in your day, uh, do your best to take control of those things. And Nora, in your video, you talk about one of the simple lessons, and it focuses on the importance of taking a break. And I'm a huge fan of breaks. A lot of us wear Apple watches, and it used to annoy me when I first got my watch when it would tell me to stand up. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now I love it. I pop up and, and I, you know, I tell our... Uh, if people look at me strange, I'm like, I must obey my watch. So I just go and do my little, you know, jog <laughs> oh, around you the, the screen. You, and you it, know. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a tiny thing. But to talk to our listeners about why this actually reaps big dividends. Oh, it, it is incredibly important. And bravo to you for getting up and running around when your watch goes off. Um, I actually keep some free weights in my office. 
um, and I'll, I'll lift them and I'll walk around and move around. Uh, some folks have get a stand up desk to, to get them up and moving. Um, again, tremendous amount of research around why it is important to take breaks uh, throughout the day. Um, I want to recommend another book to folks, and it's a book called Brain Rules by a man named John Medina. He is a scientist and a molecular biologist, but he's written a book that is really accessible and fun to read. And uh, it, it dispels so many myths about how to be more effective in our work, how to improve our cognition and thinking ability. And much of it revolves around not just taking breaks, but exercise and all kinds of other things that we can do for our physical health that really improve our mental health and cognition. Um, but in terms of taking breaks throughout the day, everybody should get up and move ideally every 30 minutes. And th that means doesn't mean you have to take a walk around the block. Literally stand up from your computer and stretch, take a couple of steps, touch your toes, you know, twist your spine, um, get up and move if only for just a couple of moments. And at the same time, give your eyes a break, look away from your computer screen, look out the window, change your point of view. I urge people to have uh, photographs of people that they love and places that they've been that they love to surround them in their office so that when you take a break, you can look at things that make you happy uh, and make you feel good. Again, there's a lot of research that tells us that when we are in a positive and happy state of mind, we are better thinkers. We are more creative thinkers. So I say, hey, if it makes you feel good a couple times a day to go watch a short video or something that makes you laugh uh, and relaxes you, you are going to be a better thinker and you're going to do a better job for your clients. Now, that is antithetical, I know, to what we've all learned about work and keeping our nose to the grindstone and, you know, and, and billing every single second of the day. But the truth is that if we're taking breaks throughout the day, we're just going to be better lawyers. You're going to be better thinkers. Uh, and again, don't take my word for it. Start experimenting with some of these ideas. I don't think that a 30-second break every 30 minutes or so throughout the day is really going to make a huge impact on, 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 on billable numbers, if that's your concern. It's going to make you a better lawyer in the process. Speaking of doing a better job for clients, uh, in the CLE, you discuss the Pareto principle, which, as it applies to lawyers, states that 80% of revenues uh, come from just 20% of clients. So the idea is to assess where clients fall on the spectrum, focus on high-value clients, and maybe consider firing lower-value clients. Um, but as you mentioned in the video, the key is to stop taking on those D clients in the first place. So how can lawyers identify potentially bad or low-value clients prior to taking them on? Like, what are, what are the red flags that, you know, on that first phone call or that first meeting should indicate, mm, maybe I shouldn't <laughs> proceed? That is a, another great question. So there are some universal red flags, I think, that most lawyers would agree upon. And some of these red flags don't reveal themselves immediately, and some of them do. So what I suggest is that each lawyer have a very clear understanding of what constitutes a D client or a bad client for their own practice, because again, this is going to vary from lawyer to lawyer and law firm to law firm. What are some of the universals though? Well, a client who doesn't pay their bills. And let's, from the intake perspective, a client who is, oh, late to their appointment, a client who perhaps treats your receptionist badly. I mean, I really, you should really pay attention to that client from the first moment that they contact your office, whether they call in and perhaps they're, they're rude to whoever is doing intake. That should be noted. Uh, if they push back on requested documents, that should be noted. If they happen to mention that, oh, they're already represented, but they want to look for another lawyer, that would be a big red flag, I think, to most attorneys. I encourage my clients to have something called a potential client scorecard, which actually lists out these kinds of red flags and allows everyone from your intake person to your receptionist to you, the lawyer, when you're sitting in your office to um, note potential warning signs of a D client before they actually get into your practice. 
again, those those signs are going to be a little bit different for every lawyer, uh, and there are going to be some universals that I think all lawyers would agree on. Um, and it is important to keep those D clients out of your practice for the reason that you just suggested, which is they're generating less of your revenue than your best clients, and they're probably taking up more of your time than your best clients. You're spending more time on them, I should say, right? So yeah, be very clear about what a D client is for you and and do your best to keep them out of your practice. If you have a few in there, then look into getting rid of them ethically, professionally, and appropriately. And then what is, uh, you know, while we're closing out here, what is one practical tip you can offer our listeners that they could implement today? I know you emphasize on picking one (laughs) of your five lessons. So if you had to pick one of those five lessons, which one would it be? Oh, no, not, that's not a fair question. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> like your children. You got to you gotta practice them all. Well, so let me say, the five lessons that I talk about and all 50 lessons in the book, my goal <clears throat> is for the lawyer to focus on one thing, one thing at a time, ideally, and actually right. start doing it. Um, right. A lot of what I talk about and what I've written about is, is no secret. You know, 50 Lessons for Lawyers cites over 70 other books. So these are not just my ideas. The strategies, the lessons that I talk about are backed up uh, by research and data. Um, But if I were to pick just one thing for lawyers to implement today, I'm going to have to say, I'm going to come back to the idea of taking a break. I'm going to say to start to experiment with training your brain through mindfulness meditation. And that might be surprising to you, and that might not be the one that you would think I would pick. But from my perspective, that one thing can change everything else. Because if we can have a better understanding of our own brains and be able to train our brains, and that's kind of how I like to think about mindfulness. I know there's been a tremendous amount of of talk about it recently. There's been a lot of writing about it, but it can sometimes feel a little too ethereal, esoteric, touchy-feely for lawyers, when the reality is that mindfulness meditation is a way not only to help you be healthier and happier and have more work-life balance and feel better, there's a tremendous number of health benefits that have been documented to be tied to mindfulness, but it is a method to actually train your brain to be a better, more effective, more focused lawyer. So if I had to pick one thing to start experimenting with in as little as a couple minutes a day, that would be it. Perfect choice. So it looks like we've reached the end of our program. Thank you, Nora Bergman, for joining us today. Thank you, Christine. If our listeners have questions or they'd like to follow up, how can they find you? Uh, The easiest way to find me would be to come to my website, which is reallifepractice.com. You can also simply Google my name, Nora Reva Bergman. I think I'm the only Nora Reva Bergman in Google. Uh, So you can find me there. I'm also on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So I would love to hear from folks, especially if you if you watch the uh, the presentation. I'd love to hear from you and know which lessons you might have implemented, how they're working for you, and any feedback that you might have. Great. So if you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. Join us next time for another episode of the Florida Bar Podcast, brought to you by Legal Fuel, the Practice Resource Center of the Florida Bar on Legal Talk Network. I'm Christine Bilbrey. And I'm Carla Eckhart. Until next time, thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to the Florida Bar Podcast, brought to you by the Florida Bar's Practice Resource Institute and produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find the Florida Bar, the Florida Bar Practice Resource Institute, and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. 
As always, consult a lawyer.